changes in the, the tissue transglutaminase, deaminase, cicleus, and peptides. You get negatively charged residues of the glutamic acid, and um, you get a change in the T cell response by the change in the tissue to transglutaminase. We think that what happens with celiac um, disease is that in part it may have been due to an infection and there's some molecular mimicry that is the initial, is the initial insult. Um, this is a patient, a normal small bowel, where you get these normal uh, finger-like projections of the small bowel and with exposure to gluten, you get damage, you get these increase in the sensitized lymphocytes, you get damage to the bowel wall, and you get flattening of the lining of the small bowel. With adherence to a gluten-free diet, the patient will completely reconstitute their, um, their small bowel, and you will not be able to tell that they've, that they've had damage like that. All right. Celiac disease is also associated with, uh, with dermatologic so uh, issues, uh, dermatitis herpetiformis. So if you have a patient who's presenting with diarrhea um, and, you're, uh, you, and you get a rash picture, this would be characteristic of a dermatitis, dermatitis herpetiformis. Um, these patients, if you biopsy the skin, would have IgA deposition in the upper, upper papillary dermis. It typically affects the elbows, the knees, the buttocks, and the back. Um, so the two tie in together. All right, I think that we're going to finish up here in the last uh, little bit with inflammatory bowel disease. And again, uh, the therapies are going to be very, very similar with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Um, what is going to help is that the features of ulcerative colitis, it's colon only, it's diffuse and it's contiguous, it's mucosal, and it's seen more commonly in non-smokers. Matter of fact, if you have a patient who presents with colitis, um, they were smokers, they stopped smoking, and two months later, they present with a clinic picture. It would, it's very likely to be ulcerative colitis. That's one of the scenarios where we see first presentation. Crohn's disease can affect anywhere from the mouth all the way to the anus. It is asymmetric, it's focal. These patients have transmural inflammation, so the inflammation goes through the entire lining of the bowel wall. You're more commonly, you more commonly see these in smokers. And actually, there are a number of studies now that show that we can probably do better with patients with active Crohn's disease by stopping them smoking than any of the immunologic therapies that we have. So one of the really things that, the things that we try hard to do with patients with Crohn's disease is stop smoking. These patients will have, may have perineal disease, they may have fistulas, and they may have granulomas. You get any of these, um, it's Crohn's disease, it's not ulcerative colitis. So etiologic factors in Crohn's disease, um, there are genetic abnormalities that are starting to be more and more well described. Um, with Crohn's disease, about 15% of patients will have a positive family history of IBD. We think that there are antigenic uh, triggers such as microbial pathogens, maybe dietary factors, and the environmental factors. Smoking, um, yes. Um, there's also some thought that use of oral contraceptives and NSAIDs may make one more prone to get Crohn's disease, and there's now a growing body of literature on Accutane, um, probably a little bit more so with ulcerative colitis, but also with Crohn's disease. All right, so differential diagnosis, since Crohn's disease predominantly is going to involve the ileum in some way, over 70% of patients have the ileum involved, um, you need to think about a variety of diseases of the right lower quadrant, including uh, the um, acute appendicitis, periappendiceal abscess, fecal diverticulitis, tubo ovarian disease disorders, endometriosis, and then certainly neoplasms of the, of the ileum um, would be all in your differential diagnosis. So tissue is very helpful. Scanning is very helpful. Patients are going to present with abdominal pain, diarrhea, weight loss. Um, in children, the first thing you may see is them falling off the growth curve. Fever and perineal disease, you want to rule out fecal pathogens. 
uh, and you want to include uh, a CBC SED rate. Albumin is very important when you're looking at these patients because it may help reflect the severity of disease. And then the common Im imaging studies would be a small bowel follow through CT or CT enterography, and then endoscopy. Um, if you have predominantly ileal disease, you want to try to get in the ileum to look at it, capsule endoscopy will help with that as well. And then this just, just, just shows you some examples. Um, this is a patient with very severe Crohn's disease. She's already had a couple of resections. And you can see this is dilated. This becomes very narrow. This is dilated. And, um, and these are the areas that would be affected with the Crohn's. These are more normal areas that are dilating upstream. CT enterography, um, you have thickening of the ileum coming in here. So if you're given a CT enterography, try to find the ileum, see if you've got thickening there. Um, this is certainly very classic for Crohn's disease with small bowel follow-through. Endoscopic appearance, again, it's going to be patchy. Um, they describe linear serpiginous ulcers. Crohn's disease is associated with stricturing disease, ulcerative colitis not so much. If you get stricturing disease with ulcerative colitis, you've got to think about a colon cancer. And so classically punched out linear <coughs> ulcers would be very classic with, with Crohn's disease. And this is just an example that shows you a skip lesion. This is normal, normal, bad, bad. If you looked at just this, it's what you would have thought it was ulcerative colitis. And you can see the, the wall thickening in the patient with Crohn's disease. The clinical features uh, uh, have to do, in very many cases, due to the transmural nature. Um, you, with inflammation, you get pain, tenderness, and diarrhea. With as you get stricture formation, you may get cramps, distension, and vomiting. And then as the disease works its way through the bowel wall, you get fistulas. So you may get an enteroenteric fistula, it may go to the bladder, an enterovesicle, may go to the retroperitoneum, or it may go to the skin with enterocutaneous. And this, this just shows you some examples. Um, these are uh, retroflexion in the rectum, and um, these holes should not be there. Those are fistulas from the rectum out. And these are just some examples of some extremely bad perineal disease with holes that should not be there. Um, this is, would be a classic picture of an abscess. You see this red raised area besides the peritoneal area, intra-abdominal abscess, and then this would be an example of an uh, x-ray you'd see with a small bowel obstruction with multiple loops of dilated bowel. <coughs> um, just the other thing to just keep in mind, if you either have a lot of small bowel involved or you resect over 100, you resect over 100, um, actually, you resect the terminal ileum and the patient has diarrhea, you can get uh, malabsorption of B12, because you remember the specialized receptors for absorption of B12 are in the terminal ileum, so they can get a B12 deficiency as well as bile salt diarrhea. These patients get much better by treating them with B12 supplementation and also with Questran to bind up the bile salts. And then finally, ulcerative colitis. The differential is going to be really infectious and then a variety of other things that can damage the colon. The patient may just have the rectum involved. It may go all the way around. These patients, Crohn's disease patients, unless they have bad Crohn's colitis, may present with diarrhea, but rarely with a lot of bleeding. Um, ulcerative colitis almost always presents with bleeding. They may present first with a little mucus production, a little bit of urgency, but as they're developing the diarrhea, it tends to be a bloody diarrhea. Tenesmus is caused by the rectum getting kind of rigid and inflamed, and these patients will all have this tenesmus or feeling of urgency. Again, same thing with crampy abdominal pain, weight loss, fever, growth retardation. Uh, growth retardation, the evaluation is going to be very, very similar. Um, if you have a patient coming in acutely in the hospital, you want to make sure you've done a plain film to rule out toxic dilatation, but endoscopy is really going to help you make your diagnosis. And this, remember with the ulcer, to, with the Crohn's disease patients, we saw a lot of punched out ulcers, linear ulcers. This looks like a burn. It's, it's superficial, it's red, there may be a lot of mucus and pus um, this is almost all covered with this sort of mucopus there. And as you move on, you'll get a cutoff to normal mucosa um, in patients with limited left-sided disease. 
The big thing to be aware with ulcerative colitis is actually the risk of colon cancer. It's, if you look at the risk of colon cancer with patients with pancolitis, it starts at about 10 years from diagnosis. So we usually start dysplasia screening with colonoscopy and biopsy about eight to 10 years after diagnosis and do it every two to three years initially and then annually um, doing random biopsies looking for dysplasia as well as targeted biopsies. Treatment in two minutes. Um, this is very similar uh, across for both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. We may start with antibiotics and aminosalicylates. Um, aminosalicylates are the mainstay of therapy with ulcerative colitis. Sulfasalazine, Asacol, Pentaza, those kinds of medicines, they're a little bit less useful in Crohn's disease because most of the aminosalicylates are really designed to be either ileal or clonic release. They do not get up higher in the small bowel. We then often will move to immunomodulators, things like Imuran, azathioprine, methotrexate, and corticosteroids. And in here, we throw in the biologics, um, such as infliximab or now the other anti-TNF, Humira, Simzia. Um, Tysabri, um, you may see a question on, on Tysabri. Tysabri is sort of uh, fourth, fifth, sixth line medicine for, for Crohn's disease. It's also used in MS. It's very restricted in its use because of its complication. And some of you have probably seen at least one person with this complication recently. Do you know what the complication type is? PML. PML. Um, and PML is devastating. We um, most of the PML cases with Tysabri have been described in MS patients. UNC has the distinct the distinction of having the second Crohn's patient um, who's had PML, and um, it's really it's it's um, devastating. Most of the patients who get PML die. Um, all right. Okay. Final question, I think. This is a 28-year-old female treated for six years for Crohn's disease of the ileum. Main symptoms have been diarrhea, abdominal pain. She's continued to have active disease over the past year. Despite the use of mesalamine, she's required frequent courses of steroids. In fact, she's been unable to get completely off of prednisone for the past four months. Crohn's disease six years, no prior surgery, ileal involvement, mesalamine four grams per day, prednisone uh, 20 milligrams per day. What is the most appropriate treatment at this time? Number one, admit to the hospital for IV cyclosporin. Number two, increase um, mesalamine for, from four grams per day to six grams per day. Number three, initiate therapy with azathioprine. Number four, evaluate for surgical resection as patient is a treatment failure. And number five, admit to the hospital for TPN. How many for number one? Number two? Number three? Number four? And number five? Um, so, um, TPN actually is useful, bowel rest in Crohn's disease is useful, it's not so useful in ulcerative colitis, but she's actually um, does fairly well on the prednisone, just can't get off of it. So azathioprine would be appropriate. If this patient were sick, what you probably would choose, which is not one of the answers up here, you probably would choose um, anti-TNF therapy or infliximab. There, the difference between the two, both of them are very effective in terms of steroid sparing agents. Azathioprine and 6 mercaptopurine take about three months before they become effective because they're working on new lymphocytes, new lymphocytes made in the marrow. And so between six weeks and three months are, is the time it's going to take. So you really can't depend on that for a very sick patient. Whereas initiation with anti-TNF therapy, if it's going to work, you really see something within that first week. Um, so that would be the appropriate answer in a very sick patient. Cyclosporin, um, you're not going to see that because there's a lot of controversy right now. We use a lot of more cyclosporin for fulminant colitis here. Um, but if you look at the rest of the world, they use a lot of infliximab. And why is that? The reason why is because cyclosporin um, really has a higher efficacy rate, but you, it's difficult to use oral cyclosporin long-term just because of the kidney effects, the hypertension effects, whereas if you have a patient who responds to infliximab for fulminant colitis, that is something that you can continue long-term. Um, but the, the reason we go with the cyclosporin is because the initial efficacy rate is a little bit better than with the infliximab. And I think I am going to stop there. Um, you'll have my slides. Um, you should know um, the recommendations for colon cancer screening because that would be uh, something that you would commonly be doing in practice is making colon cancer screening recommendations. 
and um, there are a couple of things there. All right, but you have another talk. Okay, thanks. Thank you.